Yeah, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in a conversation with Judith Bernstein, a pioneering uh, feminist artist. Um, how can we think about art at a time like this is an online exhibition curated by Barbara Pollock and myself in response to the current mm -hmm. global crisis. We've asked artists and thought leaders to join us in a conversation and present work that creates a dialogue around the many crises happening globally. On March 17, we launched the exhibition with six artists and have been adding new artists each day. Some of the participating artists are Ai Weiwei, Judith Bernstein, Amir Faha, um, Baron Benani, Lynn Hersman, Lehman, and many more. Uh, today we'll be having a conversation with Judith Bernstein, our first participating artist, um, about how you can think about art at a time like this, how can you make art at a time like this, um, and some of her artwork. So please welcome Judith for today, uh, today's conversation. And thank you all so much for being patient and still uh, being on the phone with us, 31 participants. So I'm, I'm really happy that you guys are all here. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for, so, thanks for for holding on. <coughs> Guys are terrific. <laughs> so Judith, before I begin, I just want to ask you, how are you doing these days? I'm actually doing quite fine. Um, I think that we're all in tremendous amount of shock. We're we're just shocked beyond belief that this happened so fast and it's so a pandemic all over. But um, I've hunkered down and I have a schedule and I'm working on my own work right now that's dealing with the coronavirus, that's dealing with death universe, that's dealing with issues that are happening right now. So um, when I zone out the, the outside stuff and I just concentrate on what I'm doing, it's fine. But, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's not like an elephant in the room. It's like a... Um, it's 40 million elephants in the room at this point, but it's fine. Um, there's also a, 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 um, a, a kind of a feeling of this, if you don't have a schedule, that um, it's like um, uh, Groundhog Day over and over and over again. <laughs> Very surreal. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask you, yeah. A lot of people don't know what your work was like at the beginning. We're going to show a couple of paintings from when you were in school at Yale in the 60s. That's um, How did you get started working the way you were? Well, you know, you know what's the funny thing? Um, you, had, you had mentioned to me, how in the world did you get, would you ever think that you could ever get to where you are now from where you were when you were a student? No. Absolutely, by the way. I started out with these fuck Vietnam paintings when I was a student at Yale. What happened was I read an article in the New York Times and it said, stop, it said, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? And, um, and I thought, fabulous. I'm, go I'm going into the bathrooms, by the way, and see what they have. Yale at that time, I was a graduate student of Yale when, in 1966 when I read that in the Times, and I went into the bathrooms, and it was an all-male school as an undergraduate school. So I did this painting, which you see on the screen now, Cock Man Shall Rise Again. It's about, this one has to do with the portrait of our governor, Governor George Wallace, a very reactionary governor. And um, there's a lot of graffiti on here. And in the bathrooms at Yale, the people could draw well, but when they got into the bathroom, they just wrote something and then wrote another line like tweaks. It's like the early thing of tweaks, the graffiti. And I started doing these graffiti drawings. And so it's not a shock to see where I'm at at this point in time. Um, so Judith, yeah. What kind of the reaction to like some of your professors and other people around you on your work initially? Well, you know, I'll tell you something. I think that they were shocked, but I'm not quite sure how shocked they were because they didn't discourage me. They thought it was interesting. They, and at that time, um, I'm 77. And at that point in time, when I was at Yale, I went from an undergraduate school directly to Yale. Um, people were looking at Frank Stella. And then, and there were, and then uh, um, more minimal stuff started coming in. So this was so from left field, by the way. It was just so out of sight. And I remember going to a gallery um, 
uh, and showing my work and I said, oh, I do, um, I, I, I do sexual work. And the guy said there, he said, I'm only the accountant, but I'd love to see your work. So um, it, was, it, was, it was another, it was truly another time. And um, I got a kick out of it. When I was a student there, they had a they had a lot of writers. They had John Guare, who who wrote um, House of Blue Leaves and is a writer and wrote Atlantic City, and they had um, 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 Ron Liebman, a, 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 an actor who recently died, and Ken Brown, who wrote The Brig. So these guys these guys would come to my studio. Now they were part of an ABC fellowship, so they were about five years older than myself. So they came to my studio and they told me all the words, prick, dick, uh, you know, cock, cunt, you know, and it was, it was a lesson and I felt like one of the guys and I frankly had a great time. So it was a lot, a lot of fun for me. So that was where I was at, at Yale with this. And I went to, and then I did this one uh, super cock painting. It's a drawing and a man flying through the air with a, with a cock three times the size of himself and it has graffiti on it. This may not be heaven, but Peter hangs out here. And um, it's, um, it's, it's fun. It also deal, deals with masculinity. It, deal, it, deals with, um, it deals with masculinity and um, in, a, in a very hyper way. And we were very aware of that because at the time it was the Vietnam War and, all, and the men were being drafted. And because of the draft, there was enormous amount of protest, not like now, but enormous amount of protest. There were a million people having protests in New York City and other places. So it was, it, I also had always a lot of humor in my work because I think it cuts down on the seriousness, it's fun, but it, but it also packs a great wallop. It's fun, but it's goddamn serious. So, um... So I was going to ask you this. Go ahead. It seems like you've always been a feminist. When I met you in 1990, oh, yeah. you were a role model for me with your feminism. But um, where where did that start? Well, you know, you know, I'll tell you something. I was very much aware of um, of the inequities, and that is one of my big things about what what I'm interested always is is dealing with inequities, and um, when I met you, this, the show that you're looking at here, when, um, when I was at Penn State, which I went to as an undergraduate in, the, in 1960, there were three men to every woman. When I went to Yale, it was an all-male undergraduate school. When I graduated, the, the, uh, the galleries had very, very few women. So as a result, I was very, I was very sure that we were locked out and we had no place to show. We, and uh, so a gallery started, AIR, Artists in Residence, and we, we had all, it was, a, it was a gallery that had all women in it. And the title, AIR, was something that Howard Dina Pindell had come up with because she was thinking Jane Eyre. We were thinking of how you could uh, figure out a name that would be appropriate and not the director because it was a co-op. So, and I said, twat, 20 women artists together. But as usual, I was ahead of my time. But, but also, I actually didn't take that, that title seriously either because I knew that it was too far out. But when you see this show, the exhibition, this, this show was in 1973. That was, uh, that was about 50 years ago. And this show, you see the installation, the one on the back wall, horizontal, is actually the most well-known of my pieces. It's a combination of, of being anti-war, it's also sexual, and it's also feminist, and mine is bigger than yours. You, when, you have, when, you have a, when you have this, when you have a cock, women, by the way, have a, women have a penis in a metaphorical sense. Men, of course, have the penis in a literal sense, but they don't own the copyright of the image. And this is something that I thought of feminism as me observing the men and seeing how they behave. 
And you see on the right, these four sc screw drawings that look like missiles. They are a combination of screws and phalluses. And they also are very psychological. And my work, I've always gone into my subconscious and my pre-conscious and thought of ways to handle this, uh, handle this subject matter. So this, this was something that um, I, I did in 73, and I continued doing these screw drawings for a very long period of time, for about, for about you know, 15, 20 years, a long time, yeah. All right, thank, thank you. Do you think that it has gotten better for, for women uh, artists compared to, to, to the 90s? Oh my God, is it being better? Of course, it is extraordinarily better. You know, you see, there are still, there are still inequities. But the point here is that it is much better than that time frame. That time frame, there were hardly any women showing. And when you'd have a gallery like Castelli, you might have a Lee Bonacu, you might have um, um, uh, Hannah Darboven, you have just a couple women and all the rest are guys, and no one really thought about it. When we thought about having, for example, a sculpture show, they'd put all guys in there. They but if they would have a show with all women, that was considered feminist. So it, there was enormous amount of inequity. Women were really shut out of the system. And they were very shut out of the system when they went to graduate schools like myself and a lot of the people from AIR. I went to Yale, a lot of people went to Carnegie Tech and other places, and they had nowhere to show. And they did not, they were not able to get university jobs and things like that. So they were completely shut out of the system. So um, it was very important at, in, in, to have a show, uh, to have a gallery in 19th, in, in, um, um, in, in, when, when we started in 1972, when AIR started. So it also, the gallery had, the aesthetic of the gallery was, was um, more conceptual. So it was a good, um, it was a good title, by the way. AIR, AIR was a very good title for that. And um, that's where this started. This piece that we're talking about right now. talk a little bit about, this is one of the works that you'd have sent to us for, to include in the exhibition. Can you talk a little bit about this work, but also... Why did you think of setting this and, and the other paintings that you sent to us? And why do you think it's relevant to, to the to context of the exhibition, but also the context that we find ourselves in now in this kind of global crisis? Why did you select this one in particular? Well, um, recently I had a show at the Drawing Center and it was called Cabinet of Horrors. And I named it. <laughs> it wasn't just magically appeared. That was the name that I used for that show. And it was against Donald Trump. It was in, in, and I did those pieces in 2016. This one I did in 2017. I also had a show after the drawing show, which was three months at the drawing center. I also had a show at Paul Kasman, which um, I used a black light. I have a lot of fluorescent paint on it. I used black light. And I thought that it was also, it was a very, it's a very surreal time with Donald Trump being a president. So this of course is, um, putting the finger to Donald Trump. He has, he has a, a, um, a phallus for a face. He has his hair, his orange hair. He has a little mustache like Adolf Hitler and a, and a swastika. And you also have all American spread eagles. So you have a feminine, feminine bottom and you have the, uh, the presidential seal, e pluribus unum, on the bottom. So it was, it was a, this one was done in, in 2017, and it is very pertinent to today because of the horror and the incompetency that we have um, as the President of the United States, a real con man who um, was a celebrity, was a, a TV celebrity that became President of the United States. It's, a, it's um, quite a, a horrible, uh, horrible thing. And he's a very dangerous man. So now we have the coronavirus which I'm working on some series of that too. But nevertheless, even uh, before that, I was thinking of Death Universe um, because I was thinking of uh, the fact that Donald Trump was so, um, he was t uh, 
taunting Kim Jong-un, and he was also taunting um, Putin schlong and Do uh, uh, Trump and schlong, by the way, uh, taunted, taunted these guys. And something very dangerous could have happened with Kim Jong-un, like a nuclear war. And also, there is also the combination of satellite, uh, of black holes eating each other, and also the combination of um, uh, um, a, a comet, by the way, hitting the Earth. And I didn't even think about the fact that right at this moment, we have this pandemic that is just um, horrific. And that also is another um, death of the universe. So I don't, I think that we will outlive this crisis, but it's very serious. So that's why I think it's, it's pertinent today. Judith, yeah. I love this painting, by oh, the way. I was so great. thrilled when you sent it to us. Great. But what I want to know is um, how you keep up your anger and your passion about these things, because yeah. I've mellowed a little bit over the years, you know, but <laughs> right. you seem to still be right on the edge. I want to tell you something. It's absolutely true. I, you know, something is funny. I, you know, I'm actually very fortunate in this respect that the anger that I have and the work that I'm doing is always on the edge and I get enormous kick out of it. I get a kick out of it. So it keeps me going, but it's true that when you mellow, um, you can't, you can't be as outrageous and hilarious. And I love using all the cunt faces and all these wonderful terms that are the last bastion of crudity, you know, that's here. But how do I keep it going? It's very easy when you, when you hear the news. Um, oh, this piece, this I love, by the way. This piece, um, I did an installation at um, Studio Voltaire in London. And it is, um, it's a repurposed church. And it's, um, I, I did everything right there. It was a commission. I did everything right there. The piece on the back wall is Cunface, which I love using that term. And I did this piece in, in, in 2014. It is 18, 18 and a half foot square. That's how large it is. It's humongous. And, um, and also it's like where it is the centerpiece where the altar is. And you have all these cocks that I redid this time, not with paper, but I redid them on um, on linen, on on linen. So they they're kind of marching toward the um, this 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 uh, this uh, cun face, which was Birth of the Universe series. It's Birth of the Universe, I thought, because it was actually um, it's a black hole. It's women at the center of the universe, and it also makes an analogy between birth, female anatomy, and it's cunt face, cock eyes, cunt face. So it has penises that are very infanticized right around the edges, but the woman is the strong one, the strong one with the, with the cock eyes, with the uh, cock eyes. So uh, this piece is actually now in a witch's show that is an, in California at, um, um, and Deitch projects. It happens that it's closed because all galleries are closed. But nevertheless, um, the show was was organized by Laurie Simmons and Dan Nad Nadel, and um, it's it was called All of Them Witches. So this piece is the centerpiece of that show because it's far larger than anything else. And size matters. <laughs> it is a very large piece. I went to I went to that show in February in LA when it was still open. It was oh, fabulous! Yeah, yeah. It is. It's a really uh, large painting. Um, yeah. Well, you know, some it's 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 funny because um, the guy from um, um, the Whitney Museum, who's a friend of mine, um, was saying that um, um, it's my pieces are not just large they have a large presence even when they're small so that they they command a great deal of space yeah they certainly do they certainly do um we have a final question for you sure, sure, sure. Uh, you you supported yourself as a professor for most of your career oh god uh, yes god how yes to, how does it feel to finally gain international success 
Well, you know something, I was supporting myself with, with hand to mouth, frankly. I was always a part-time uh, poor time in, uh, a professor. And I taught for, um, frankly, I taught for 50 years. I taught for over 30 years at SUNY Purchase, and I taught for 15 years at Queens College. And I was, I worked two days a week, and I made very little money. But now it seems it is just so fabulous to be able to do work and actually show it. This is, and not put it away, not hide it, not uh, put it away, store it, but actually have your work shown at the time. And that is, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing for me. And uh, the, um, the work that I'm doing has gotten so much, um, so much acclaim, and I've sold to a lot of museums, the Whitney, MoCA, et cetera. And it's been, it's been, an, it's been the best time of my life because my work is valued and I'm valued. And that's something we all really, women need it, but everyone needs it. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I think um, we're going to open it up to questions now great. for Judith. Great. great. And, um, well, let's give her a big applause. Yeah. <laughs> so um, on, on the bottom where it says participants, um, right. You, there's a raise your hand button. So if you guys maybe want to press that raise your hand and I can kind of call on you guys to ask some questions so we don't talk all over each other. That might be very helpful. Um, so it's like in the bottom of your screen, it says manage uh, participants or it says participants and then there's a raise your hand button. Oh, wow. Cornelia Blatter. Oh, my, my, uh, my good friend. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Judy. It's so great I to see you. So maybe maybe people want to unmute and mute themselves one at a time, if that's better. Um, yeah, does someone have a question? Oh, Susan yeah, Jennings. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to you, um, Judith. Um, I'm wondering, what? how do you see this... Um, social distancing, isolating, affecting artists in general and yourself, well, specifically yourself yeah. right now. I am assuming you're not teaching or at least not teaching um, That's right. in person. And, you know, are you able to make work and how, how's it going? As well, an you, artist? Know, you know, I'll tell you something. This is an extremely difficult time. I don't have to tell you that it is just a million people have the coronavirus and I'm sure that it is far, far larger because we don't have testing. It is unbelievable in terms, and it's, and it's something that pervades us every minute, by the way. And when you go out, there's social distancing, there's everyone is walking around with like a hazmat, you know, outfit when you're outside. Um, I, think, I think that it's, um, it's a, it's a very scary time for all of us. Now, first, of course, it is, we hope to all survive. And I'm, I'm older and I have medical issues. So um, I'm 77. So I'm in the group of, we don't know if you're going to make it, but I, I believe I will make it. Uh, anyway, um, but after that, we have to, um, I, I think that it will be a while before things tool up again. Um, it will take, they say, about a year and a half for a vaccine, maybe earlier. Um, and I think that um, they, will, they will figure out how to treat people who have the coronavirus so less people will get ill and die. I mean, really super ill and die. And uh, then, of course, we'll have the vaccine. But many people, many people will not make it, which is a you know, just a horror, just a horror. And of course, economically, oh God, oh God, that is just, we are, we, the stock market and all the, the businesses are closed. And uh, it, you know, it's funny when I go out in the street, it reminds me of a time, oh my God, how did I get out of here? Um, guys, how do I, how would I get back? You do that. You're, You're back. here, we can see you. you. You can see me? Yeah. yeah. So good. Okay. As long as you can see me, the hell with this other stuff. <laughs> um, 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 I think that um, uh, it's it's very it's very it's very it's just extremely scary, and uh, um, I think it will take uh, quite a long time to get back. But I know 
know that I, I'm working all the time. If you have a schedule, and not only that, I just finished a, a big painting yesterday, and I'm thrilled with the way it looks, so that gives me a lot of energy. So it's, it's, uh, it's really a great pleasure to, to be able to do that. But nevertheless, it is, it is very scary as hell in terms of the economics, and obviously uh, there'll be less people buying art, there'll be uh, less um, fairs, and galleries will close. So it's, it's going to be a very tough time, but we'll get out of it, but it'll be a tough time for a long time. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Cornelia, I would love to speak to you. Hi, Judy. Hi. I, uh, it's so fantastic to see you. <laughs> oh, listen, can I tell you something? It's so terrific to see you. And also, um, Cornelia and I taught together at SUNY Purchase a long time ago. And she's a, a fabulous artist and a designer. And she is in uh, the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And she and her husband and her two fabulous children. And I miss you. And um, it's so nice that you're on this chat. They're just great. Just great. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you just made my day. It's so oh, nice to great. see you. <laughs> great. No, no, I love you. And I'm so glad that you were able to do this. This is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Are there, is there any question you would love to ask me? Oh. <laughs> Even if you don't ask a question, I'm cool to see you. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want, I yeah. want you to stay safe and I uh, yeah. hope you're, you're staying safe on the inside. And uh, I'm very happy to hear that you're so active doing works. Yes. You know something? Um, it took a while because I think that the first... I was first in tremendous shock, by the way, you know, and, and all of a sudden we're hit with something that is this horrendous. And it's funny when I was saying, when you go outside, the streets are blank. There's no traffic. There's like two cars on the street. It's like those sci-fi movies that we had when we were a kid. We were always worried about the bomb, the atom bomb, the hydrogen bomb. And you would have these horror movies that would have maybe one or two people alive. But it reminds me of that when you go around and there's buses go by, there's no one on the bus. It's just, it's quite a, um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. 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 But I'm not, I'm not alone in that. That's, you know, that's what it is. Yeah. We have Jamie wanting to ask yeah. a question. I just unmuted you. Jamie P, do you have right. a question? Hi, I'm Jamie. Thank you so I'm, much, Judith. Oh, no, um, great. Yeah. Uh, I'm reading um, yeah. something that was quoted by you on your exhibition page on the right. other other time, like this website. It says, stay yeah. home, stay healthy, buy art. Yeah. And that part, yeah. buy art, I was wondering why you made a reference to the market, whereas this website is focused not on the market. Can you expand on that? Well, you know, I'll tell you something. I said buy art because I think that um, it's always a good time to buy art. And it also keeps the artists alive. It keeps their energy alive. And it, and something, and, the, and art is such an important part of not only our lives, but the lives of the world. And it, it speaks, it speaks for um, our humanity. It speaks for, um, what um, what lasts, by the way, through ages is the art. So it's a very important thing to continue, in spite of the fact that right now you're thinking, "Oh my God, you know, why think about art?" But art is art is part of our life, and it also gives us a great deal of subs sustenance. And it's an, it's very it's very important to think of that. Yeah, and also to for the artist to think. What is, their, what is their next move? What do you want to say in this time? And whatever it is, put it down. Because um, you will feel it will also make us feel much better, the artists much better. And for me, uh, of course, I'm dealing, I'm dealing specifically with, the, with these issues, um, with um, uh, the coronavirus and Donald Trump and all that. Um, it, it, it is a great release for me. So that it works very well in that way. But Anybody I know else? Pardon, I'm sorry. 
Does yeah. someone else have a question? Uh, have a question for Judith or for yeah. Barbara and I? I don't see any hand raises. Yeah. Barbara, <laughs> Judith, <laughs> Judith, is there anything that you feel like you want to say uh, on this topic, on, on uh, what we've talked about? Do you feel like we've, we've missed anything important? No, you know, I'll tell you something. Um, there's, there's so much, you know, um, when you talk about your work, there's a whole history of the work. And one thing, my work is kind of like on a continuum so that it starts out, it starts out, it's really about my subconscious and all the things, and it's almost like a diary. And you, every thing, every time that you do something, it's about what, how I'm reacting to the outside world. But it's really, um, it's really psychological. And the psychological part of it makes it much more interesting, and it also um, nails nails the issues. I did a piece, for example, that was called The Fun Gun, and it was at the New Museum show, and that was an anatomical drawing of a phallus, and it had uh, bullets, 45 bullets collaged on between the scrotum and the, and the phallus. <laughs> And it had a gun. It was a gun, by the way. And it, it had bullets coming out and all that. And it was, it was called a fun gun. But it has, it has a subtext to it. So it's not, only, it's not only what you see, but it's a subtext. But I've been dealing with um, this, this, macho, this machoism for a very long period of time. And it has... Um, and, and now they're, I'm using the power of the woman with the cunt faces and stuff. And I'm using that also to, to women having that extraordinary power that they, that they have that should be freed up and used. And unfortunately, what also happens is that when, um, when the art, um, uh, when when times are not good, more women show because the work that they do is less valued and costs less money. And but it's a good time to buy the work, but they can somehow never get the they've never gotten all the press and all the kudos that the men have gotten. But that doesn't mean that their work work is very undervalued and will and we'll keep going, by the way, in terms of the extraordinary value. And the, va the more that women are valued, their work will be valued, all their work will be valued. And that's so important. That's really so important. And it's important for, for, for men to know this and young girls, young men to know this. So um, I think it's, it's a very good time. No, it's not perfect, but it's, get, but it's better. I think that's a great place to end our discussion today, unless there's other questions. All right, well, thank you all for coming and thank sure. you for putting up with our glitch. This is the first time we're doing this, but we really welcome you all. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Judith, for, for, thank you. for powering through and making it to the meeting and taking great. time to talk. Yeah, about. you're wonderful. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, listen, can I tell you something? It was, it was a great pleasure and I'm, I'm thrilled to speak to the audience. Thank you. Thank great. you. Thank you, Judith. Bye. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thanks. Great, great.